Hey, Mountain View, today I have the opportunity of ministering at one of my friend's church. And believe me, I'm taking Mountain View with me. They ain't ready for this stuff, y'all. But that means that today we have a guest speaker at Mountain View Church. She's been married to her husband this year, 39 years, has three children, Kylie, Will, and Taylor, eight grandchildren, seven boys, and one girl. And she is married to my good friend, my Oklahoma, Pastor Damon Gilliland. So would you help welcome to the stage today, Miss Cindy Gilliland. Come on, Mountain View, stand up on your feet and welcome one of your own and let her know today you've got her back. Well, good morning, Mountain View. Woo! You know how to make a girl feel loved. Thank you. Thank you, Rev D, for the opportunity to share this morning. And for those of you watching online, thanks for joining us. Lean in because God's got a word for you this morning as well. Well, you know, I tell you what, I said this in the other services or celebrations as well. If that doesn't get you going, this worship team that we have, you don't need coffee. Just come to more worship celebrations. They did an awesome job. Amen. Well, today I'm sharing about generational legacy and the blessing that our kids and our grandkids get to walk in was paved way before me and Damon, it was paved by our parents and our grandparents. But I'm a product of generational faith and generational legacy, as well as my husband. So our kids have a double portion. And um, there's a family photo here on the screen of our kids and our grandkids that Pastor Daniel talked about. Look at how cute they are. Aren't they cute? There was a lot of marshmallows and candy bribing going on to get that cute picture. But... You guys are in for a treat because they're all here today on the front row in this celebration. I'll tell you what, nothing is, makes my mama's heart more proud than to see my kids worship Jesus and to be in church. Um, as Pastor Daniel said, we have eight grandkids. Seven of them are crazy and fun boys. And then God gave us a little girl. Her name is Olivia Marie Gilliland. Shoot, I'm getting, I'm getting emotional and I'm just getting started. And uh, Damon calls her OMG because of that. <laughs> Pretty cute, huh? But living a blessed life, you could look at a picture like that and you can think, oh, they have such a blessed life. We do live a blessed life, but that doesn't mean we don't go through struggles and storms and trials. Living a blessed life simply means that we know who to cling to in the middle of the storm and the struggle and the trial. That's what living a blessed life is truly all about. We've had our fair share of those struggles, but we've also seen the goodness of God come through in the midst of it. We live in a decade, a time, a season right now of something called social media influencers. Yeah. We got any influencers in the room? I am not one of them. However, I want you to know these blue glasses that I'm wearing, I have influenced at least 10 strangers to purchase them off of Amazon. And I did not receive, receive one penny of compensation for that, though I should. And, um, you know, it's the truth. We are all influenced by somebody, and we are in turn influencing somebody else. It's just the nature of our life. It's what we do. We're all influencing someone. But the question is, is it for good is it for bad? That depends on you and it depends on me. Have you ever heard the term monkey see, monkey do? Well, it's an interesting thing because it's this phenomenon, not only in people, but in animals as well. There's, there's a natural cycle of a generational pattern that happens in what we see becomes part of our behaviors. And I read this story this week about this canine dog that was part of, it was like the fastest dog in the police unit. When she was chasing after somebody, she got hit by a, a car. And when that happened, the vet began to work on her and they realized they weren't gonna be able to save her legs. Like she, she, her back legs didn't function the same. But when they were working on her, they discovered she was pregnant with puppies. And, um, and so when they, they did the best they could to fix her, she delivered all her puppies, and they were all kind of astounded that all the puppies were healthy, had no injuries to them. 
But as she began to nurture her puppies and she would walk with her back legs dragged against the ground, those healthy puppies who were walking normal began to drag their back legs because the behavior of what they were watching and the pattern of behavior they thought was normal even though they were healthy and they could have walked properly. They then, once the puppies could leave the, the litter, they were able to put them with other dogs that had healthy legs and reverse that to show them that they could walk healthy and upright because monkey see, monkey do. Well, it's the same with us. We've all been modeled some generational pattern from our parents and our grandparents. We've adopted behaviors, lifestyles, approach to life, both positive and negative, unless we have an intentional posture to supernaturally break free from those negative traits and patterns that have been exposed to us. We're also flu uh, influenced by our culture and the society that we live in and the belief system that's in our society. We're seeing that in the next generation where they're being told that all things are fluid. No, they're not. We have to shut that down and remind them of the truth of God's word because we're all influenced by the places that we live and the people that we're around. But the good news is that Jesus, through his shedding of his blood, and if you are a believer in Christ, you and I have the opportunity to have a new bloodline. That's the good news for each of us. It is the good news that we can walk in the new things that God has for us, and we can break free from those generational patterns that are not honoring to the Lord. So regardless of your background, regardless of what's been modeled to you, you have a choice today to change that and have God's legacy flow through your life as it flows through mine, and you will influence the next generation after you. We all are passing down something. You just have to decide, is it gonna be something good or something bad, does it have eternal value? The choice is yours in what you're passing down. I want you to, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Deuteronomy 6. If you don't, it will be on the screen behind me. But I want to read to you a scripture that reminds us of that. Starting in verse 1, These are the commands and decrees and regulations that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. You must obey them in the land that you are about to enter and occupy you and your children and grandchildren must fear the Lord your God as long as you live if you obey his decrees and commands you will enjoy a long life listen closely Israel now whenever you see a name like that in Israel you're like well who is he talking to he's talking to the Israelites in this scripture but put your name in there listen closely Gillilands, listen closely, McClarty's, listen closely, Mountain View. Put your name in there because God's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. But he's saying, pay attention here. I have something I want you to hear. And be careful to obey. Then all will go well with you and you will have many children in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord your God of your ancestors had promised you there's always a condition for the abundance the promises to walk in the fulfillment of those things that God has it's if you do this then you get that you can't have the abundance and the promised life if you're not walking in obedience that's the way God's scriptures work then it goes on into verse 4 listen Listen, O Israel. So, you know, you feel like he's saying listen a lot, don't you? Have you guys seen that video of that little kid that's saying, listen, Linda? Listen, Linda, listen. If you haven't seen it, Google it afterwards on YouTube. It's so funny. Don't do it right now in church. And um, I was going to play it, but I don't have time. So, but the thing is, it, that's what it reminds me of. When you're reading scriptures like this, I feel like the Lord's going, listen, Cindy, listen, Cindy. You know, and it makes me kind of laugh, but you know what? Sometimes we need the Lord to be like, listen up, listen. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them 
again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home. Talk about them when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up. Tie them on your hands. Wear them on your forehead as a reminder. Write them on your doorpost in the house of your gate. This is like an a, a, a everyday post-it note for us now, right? Back in then, this is how they would do it. But we can put things all over. We can put it on our phone and alert us to remind us. But he's saying, repeat it over and over. This is not a one and done thing in scripture. We're meant to instill these things into our kids and our grandkids. And if you don't have kids yet, you know what? You're influencing somebody, your friends, your family, your coworker. You're all influencing someone and you've all been influenced by somebody. So the word is telling us to repeat them over and over the way I read that till they roll their eyes at you. How many times do you say to your kids, go brush your teeth, go get dressed, go get your backpack, whatever it is. I watched grandkids this week for four days. They, their parents were out of town. And how many times do they say, do you have your shoes on? Where are your socks? Get your, <laughs> repeat them over and over, right? Till you get them to roll their eyes at you. Guess what? Aren't we doing the same thing? The Lord's repeating over and over, Cindy, I want you to do this. Cindy, obey me in this. Cindy, submit in this. And I'm rolling my eyes. Really, Lord? Yeah, we all do it. So as much as we might laugh at our kids rolling our eyes, don't you think we're doing the same thing with the Lord? It's a posture that we have. Again, in Deuteronomy 6, 18, it says, do what is right and good in the Lord's sight. So all will go well with you. Then you will enter and occupy the good land the Lord swore to give to your ancestors. So my sermon title this morning is, It's Not All About You. I'm sorry if you didn't realize that. I'm sorry if you feel discouraged at the very moment. But you know what the reality is? It's not all about you. And it's not all about me. Because God wants us to learn a few things this morning of how we can walk that out. The first thing I want to share with you is, one, you've got to walk your talk. Your kids catch more. More is caught than taught, right? Are you the same at home as you are in public? Are you the same at home as you are in church? Is your faith alive and well around your dinner table? Or is it only at church that your kids see you talking about the goodness of God or worshiping the Lord? More is being watched as they are seeing you at home. Are you a suffering saint or a worshiping warrior? There is a difference. They're both believers, but one is complaining the whole time. Oh, we have to go to church again. Is there another Bible study to go to? Do I have to give in the offering? Do I have to sing in the songs at worship? Do I have to go to that prayer meeting? Or are you a worshiping warrior? When life happens and tough things happen, are you saying, man, God has not brought me through this. Or you're like, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I am worshiping you through this. When I see the goodness of God, I am going to continue to worship him. Even when we're struggling and we're in this trial, your kids are watching you. Are you worshiping in the midst of the struggle and the storm? I don't like what I'm going through. I don't like this struggle. But God, you are still good. You're still on the throne and you're still going to get us through that. It is what you model. It's how you walk, walk that out. I want our children and our, our grandchildren to know their grandparents, their parents are worshiping warriors. Life's not always easy. We've gone through some tough stuff, as I've said. However, I'm going to worship through it. I'm going to praise them through the, the pain of it all. This scripture that I just read was talking to the Israelites when they had just been freed from slavery in Egypt. They were wandering in the wilderness, and they were waiting to occupy the promised land. In the midst of that, they were getting free food from heaven. Manna was just dropped out of the sky, and they were complaining about it. Now, with the cost of groceries lately, I will take anything free from the sky. Amen? But I have to admit, for 40 years, if God's just dropping tacos out of the sky, I like tacos. They're probably my favorite food. However, 40 years of solid tacos, I might be like, can we have pizza? Can we have a burger? You know, like, so I get that there's some complaining. But they had just seen this dropping from the sky. And they have to shift their attitudes just like we have to shift our attitudes to being worshiping 
warriors. That is what your kids are going to see. Damon and I have often said our greatest legacy is our three kids and their spouses raising their families to love Jesus, to serve in the local church, and to still like us. Right? I mean, you know, they're sitting in here and they're like, mm, some days, you know. But, you know, I'm just going to tell you. Kylie stayed over the other night. She dropped something off and she sat and talked and Jeff was calling her, where are you? It's like after midnight. She's like, I'm still with my parents. And he's like, do they have you hostage? No. <laughs> she had us hostage. You know, it was a mutual hostage agreement. And, um, but nothing's greater than seeing your kids, like, want to be around you now that they're gone. You know, I don't want them to move back in. But, you know, like, you love that. It's also fun, you know, if we pay for vacation, they'll go with us. So I, I love that, too. <laughs> hey, next year I turn 60, so I said, we're going on vacation and I'm paying. So you're there. Okay, so the second way that we realize it's not all about you is that we model generosity. We model generosity. Isaiah 32, 8 says, but generous people plan to do what's generous. They stand firm in their generosity. There's a posture right there in the scripture, standing firm in your generosity. That means you have a made up mind before you've ever given away whatever God's telling you to give away. You have a, a desire, a posture to be generous. You have to do that in advance. Isaiah 32, 20 says, the Lord will greatly bless his people when wherever they plant seed, bountiful crops will spring up, their cattle and donkeys will graze freely. See, generosity is simply a willingness to give liberally, both your money and your time. It's to give in abundance. It's having that desire to say, God, I, I want you to flow more through me so I can give more away. Sometimes we say that and God's like, mm, I know you. I give you more, not more is coming out right? We have to change our posture. We have to change our attitude that the more I give, God's going to, the more he, opportunity he has to give to me. Generational generosity is something that was modeled to both Damon and I by our parents. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's nice, Cindy, that you had generational faith and gener generational generosity modeled to you. I did not have that. I did not have that kind of thing from my mom or my dad. Well, guess what? Today, is your lucky day. You didn't know it, but you just won the big lottery today because guess what? Today's day one for you to be the generational generosity starter. It all starts with somebody. Somebody starts with the attitude of saying, I am going to impact the kingdom. I'm going to pass this on to my children. And if you didn't get that passed on to you, then you start it today. It starts with somebody. So today, that is the only part of this message that it actually is all about you. So grab hold of that truth. But giving and tithing is not something that Damon and I have really ever struggled with in our marriage because we started that when we were teenagers and we had our own jobs and we were modeled to tithe by our parents doing that. So it was part of what was normal. It's what we do, almost like a habit. It's something that we do, but we also saw it modeled with joyfulness. We both were shown a get-to attitude versus a have-to attitude. And so we had a made-up mind from the very beginning that we will be tithers and when we were newlyweds when we first did our first budget which Damon was in a little bit of a shock when we got married because he was used to eating hot dogs and bologna and not thinking you know he I, I think I spent more money than he was prepared for but <laughs> can I just tell you a funny quick little story so we had this software on our computer back in the ancient days of the 80s that whenever you inputted like your receipts on there it made like a cha-ching like cha-ching like a cash register like it's it's coming out of your account like all your receipts well at the time damon did the budget and i did not but i spent it all and then he inputted all the receipts and literally every time he would input a receipt and it go cha-ching he'd go <clears throat> <laughs> <sighs> And it was like, 
every breath, every grunt was like groceries, gas, movie, whatever we were spending money on. We didn't have kids at this point. And I was working full time. I was a contributor. And, um, but he would do this. And I said, do you guys ever see the movie Father of the Bride with Steve Martin? And you remember when he's in the, in the grocery store and he gets the hot dog buns and he opens up the package and he's like, I'm not paying for 10 hot dog buns when there's only eight hot dogs. And he's, he's like, this is, this, you're, you're robbing me. And he's all upset and he gets put in jail, you know. Sometimes I'd have to call Damon George because the character in the movie was George Banks. And so when Damon would get this, uh, mm, I'd be like, you're acting like George. You know, and then the, the wife in the movie, she went up to the jail and she's going to get him out of jail. And she says, George, with every sigh and every eye roll and every grunt, you're robbing a little bit of joy from our daughter planning this wedding. And I, so I say that to Damon often, with every sigh and every grunt <laughs> that you make, you're robbing the joy from my heart. So all that to say is we've, we've grown in that in 39 years. But... <laughs> My point in telling you this is that from the very beginning, Damon and I had a made-up mind to give. So when we did our budget of a car payment and our rent and whatever our bills were, we had our tithe in there. So we're not going to go out and buy a more expensive car or go get a more expensive mortgage if it meant that we couldn't pay our tithes because it was factored in as part of our normal budget. So that wasn't a struggle for us because that's something we already did. We trusted the Lord with that. I also saw that modeled in my home. Like I said, my parents showed us that. But watching generosity and watching God show up and show off in our finances in my family was something, probably my earliest memory that I have of this this impact for me when I was probably in junior high my parents my dad uh, became self-employed and he was starting his business he was a general contractor and built uh, gas stations fueling facilities and he was looking for land to purchase for his building he didn't have much money he had a little bit of money in the bank for a down payment and you know land was really expensive in the Bay Area in California and so he was looking for it, and um, he came across this acre of property, and he, they wanted a lot of money for it. My parents offered um, a much lower, ridiculous offer, and the farmer that owned it laughed at him and said, absolutely not. And so my parents just said, okay, we're just going to have to trust God in this. Well, meanwhile, the local Bible college, the president of that was a friend of my dad's. He called him up and said, hey, we're needing, we're struggling in our finances with the summer months, tuition's not here. Is there any way you could loan us some money to help us get through the summer and we'll pay you back in the fall? And my dad said, sure. So my mom and dad gave $10,000 and that was a lot of money back in the 80s. It'd be like giving 100000 now. And uh, they gave that to the college and that was the down payment on the land that they were gonna get. And as they were praying about it, my parents felt like they were supposed to give that away as a gift and not ask the college to pay it back. So my dad called them up and said, hey, you can keep the money. It's, it's no longer a loan. When meanwhile, because what God's really testing is, do you trust me, right? Do you, it's not about the dollar amount. It's not about the whole big picture. It's about, do you trust me that I got this in a way that will blow your mind? And so a few months go by, Pretty soon, this farmer was trying to build. He also had purchased a prefab steel building, and he was trying to build this to do something on the property, and he was getting the runaround from the local city building department with permits. Hmm, does that sound a little familiar with Mountain View story? And, um, and so that's a tough thing, and he kept hitting a wall, and he was from another state, and he finally said, I am done with this. And he called his realtor and he said, go see if that guy still wants to buy this land. So they called my dad and they said, are you still interested? And he goes, well, yeah, but I don't have that. I mean, it's got to be the, the lower price. I can't afford what you're asking. And the guy goes, I'm going to give it to you for 10000 less than that, which is the 10000 that they gave away to the Bible college. And they got that piece of property for less than what they were originally going to get it for. And 
he threw in the building. We didn't know the building was going to come with it. And because my dad understood building departments, he walked in and got the permits and was able to put the building up right away. We still have that land, and my brother's running that business to this day. So it's a pretty amazing story. So when you watch that and you hear my parents talking about it in the car, at home, in the morning, at night, and you're hearing it, you're like, wow won't he do it? As a kid, I knew it. I knew God would do that. And though it seemed like a lot of money and it seemed like a big situation back then, to see the hand of God do that, it was completely something that changed my faith and to believe God can do this. And my dad's, one of his favorite verses that he quoted over and over to us kids is from Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, poured into your lap. The amount you give, you, you give will determine the amount you get back. See that you can't outgive God. The more you give away, the more the opportunity the Lord has to pour back into you and share in his goodness with you and with your kids. And you have to, you can imagine that that when you're seeing this, we this wasn't something that um, we take granted. We, we look at this and we think, gosh, God is doing this abundant work in our life. And as I said, Damon and I didn't necessarily struggle with tithing, but we had, when we were newly married and our kids were little, we lived in Tucson for a few years. We were on staff at a church there. And we had tithed, but they had a mission speaker come, and he was challenging the congregation to give above and beyond your tithe to support the local missions. Now, my dad's a big missions guy. That was We got that preached to us on the daily. And, um, and I'm like, gosh, we can't really afford to give above the tithe to missions. Well, the speaker starts out with, and he says, you know, some of you spend more on dog food than you do to give to missions. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, we have two big dogs. We for sure give, spend more on dog food than we do, you know, giving to missions. And Damon and I are looking at each other, and we're talking about it, and we're praying about it. And we both felt like we got to give 50 bucks a month. We didn't have $50. I was a stay-at-home mom at the time. He was an associate pastor. I'm just telling you, there was no excess at that point. <laughs> and, um, and so we're like, okay, God, we're going to trust you. You said to give, we're going to give. Now, this happened to be around Kylie's birthday, and she was probably eight at the time. And she had asked for an Oreo cookie cake. And I was certainly not going to make something like that. I was thinking I was going to buy it. And, um, but the last money that we were going to give was this $50 to this missions offering that night. And it was like a church banquet where we're all sitting around eating dinner for this missions giving. And at the end of the night, we gave her our check and the offering thinking, well, I guess she's going to have brownies or something, you know. And, um, and the caterer comes out as we're cleaning up. Everybody else has left. It's just staff cleaning. And she goes, you know what? I don't know where this came from, but there's this random dessert that was left in the fridge. It's some kind of Oreo cake. I kid you not. We didn't eat Oreo dessert at the banquet. We had something else, but some random Oreo cake was sitting in the freezer. She goes, Does anybody want it? I'm like, oh my gosh, we do. And I'm and I'm crying and she's like, it's just Oreo dessert, you know? I'm like, you don't understand. And um and I'm crying about it, but it's like God cares about the details of your life. I'm telling you. Give him an opportunity. He will show up and show off, not only for us, but for that little girl to be reminded, God sees you. God knows what you're wanting. He sees the desires of your heart. If you trust him with the little, he's going to blow your mind with it. And then the next day, I open up my mailbox, and there's a $50 check, a rebate from some phone company, that the Lord said, there's your seed money, Cindy. And I'm like, thank you, God, for just, you know, I always, you know, do I always wonder, or I think, what if we didn't? Would there not have been the Oreo cake in the freezer? Would I have opened up the mailbox next day and that rebate check not been in there? I always think those things, but God's like, Christine, will you just listen? Listen, Linda, you know, just do what I'm telling you to do. And then two or three days later go by, and I open up the mailbox, and there's another $50 check from a doctor that I overpaid. Who overpays the doctor? Not me. But it was there. And I was so excited. I thought, 
we're shopping now. And the Lord's like, no, you're not. That is next month's seed. I'm like, oh, all right. Way to be responsible, Lord. Okay, so that's next month's. But I, I tell you all those stories because give them a chance. Test them. Try the Lord. Give and watch it be given back to you in abundance. Another story that when we planted a church in California and we did not have an income yet, Damon went to speak at a church for a guy that had a failure and, and he was speaking and, and, and they, so they gave him an honorarium check of like $250. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was like, that's groceries. That's groceries. We don't have an income. This is enough for something. But as he's driving home, he's like, I think we're supposed to give it to that guy's wife and kids that he left that I spoke for. He says, they're devastated and they have, you know, they're, they're dealing with the trauma you know, we just don't have money. <laughs> and, um, and I knew it was right. I'm going, I think you're supposed to give it away too. So we gave that away anonymously, unless she's listening online <laughs> 20 years later. And, um, and so we gave it away, and we're just like, God, we're just going to trust you. Well, later that week, Damon had a lunch with a business guy, and he was just talking, and the gentleman slid an envelope across the table, and he says, I don't need you to ask me questions about this. I just need you to trust me that God told me to give this to you. Damon's like, all right. And so he got in the car, and that envelope had $2,500 cash in it. Tell me he won't do it. Tell me when you give away the 250 that seems like all you can have. And you say, God, I trust you with the little that we have that seems like much. And he's like, girl, I got so much more for you that you can't even imagine. That's the kind of God we serve. He just needs you to trust him and to try him and watch him do above and beyond what you can fathom and imagine because that's the kind of God that we serve. He wants to do that. And as we began to come into Miracle Month in here at, at Mountain View, and we gave to the Legacy Project last year. We, we asked the God for, God for a, a number that he asked us to believe for, and he supplied it in different ways, and we gave it over payments and that thing last year. But this year, we were challenged to really pray about, God, what do you want us to give? And it, during Miracle Month, Damon had felt like a dollar amount was dropped in his heart, and he shared it with me, and I'm like, well, where's that coming from? And, um, and Damon's like, I feel like I'm, we're supposed to take it out of my retirement. Now, you got to understand, remember the guy that was going, oh, oh, every time the, you know, cashier thing was, our checking account? Like, Damon has, like, our future is something that's not already secure other than in heaven, right? Like, he can't retire on the account we currently have, so he certainly doesn't want to take anything from that retirement when, you know, he would like to retire someday. And he's like, Cindy, I think I'm supposed to take out my retirement account. And I'm like, I knew that was God. At that moment, I'm like, God's going to do something. <laughs> because there's no way he would give that out of his retirement account. And, um, and so I said, okay, I think you're right. And so then we also felt like God said, this isn't to be a payment thing. You need to take it out and give it lump sum. And we're like, well, all right now. Okay, we're going to do that. So we did, and we did it joyfully, and we get to do this. We get to watch what God's going to do. Now, I want to tell you, I have been working with a client for a year and a half trying to find them a property. A year and a half. Nothing was quite right. It was very specific what they needed. It included a goat. It's part, of, it's part of the concern, you know, you want a nice house with a pool and a sports coat, court, but you want to have a goat. It's like, I kind of don't go together. Oftentimes I'm saying, how important is the goat? And, and they're like, oh, super important. Like, all right. And so uh, we, you know, a year and a half goes by. We give this offering in Miracle Month, and the very next week a property comes on the market, and they're like, hey, this one looks good. Let's go look at it. Multiple offers all over asking, first day on the market, it's a frenzy. And, um, but you could have, they actually had two goats. The house came with two goats, two ducks, a chicken, and a cat, all for free. And it had a pool, and it has room for sports court that they can put in. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, it checks all your box. And, um, but now we're at a crazy thing. And I'm like, God, you got this. And so we got our offer accepted. And uh, I just am here to tell you that that closed two days ago. And my 
commission check is more than double what we gave in our legacy offering. And I say that to challenge you, don't limit God. Don't worry how he's going to do it. A year and a half I have been trying to close this. And God's like, there's a reason why you haven't found it because I have a story that you need to tell and it's not till next year during April. So God's working it out. You don't know what's happening next year. You don't know what's next on your agenda, but God's working something out behind the scenes and he's saying, will you trust me? Will you model generosity? Will you give when you don't know where it's coming from? I know that this was God's timing. This was Luke 6, 38. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, making room for more, running over, pouring out onto your lap. Trust me, he will do it because that's the kind of God we serve. And I challenge you to trust him in your, I don't know what yours looks like. It's not a dollar amount thing, it's a heart thing. Everything where I'm talking about is a heart and a surrendered thing. Is he in charge or are you in charge? Do you trust him with this but not with that? He's saying, I want you to trust me with it all. And you watch what I'll do. I want to live an abundant life. And an abundant life comes with open hands. I want to model generosity to our kids and our grandkids and those that I have influence over. I want to cheer you on and say, watch him do it. Trust him. You can do it. He's got a plan for you, and he wants to flow through you. And lastly, when you realize that it's not all about you, you choose to live beyond yourself. Look to the next generation. Live your faith and your obedience out loud. Be kingdom-minded. Make an impact for eternity in all of your decisions. This is something my parents did really well. There's another picture that's coming on the screen, and this is my immediate family. Um, This is actually from 2019, and there's probably at least 10 maybe that are um, added into this picture since then. I was at my dad's uh, memorial service. Yeah. But let me tell you, what's amazing about this is I'm the youngest of five kids. All five of us are serving the Lord. All five of us are living a generational life. We are all impacting the next generation for the kingdom's sake, not for our sake, but for God to be glorified, for God to be um, shared throughout the world. That's our heart. That was my parents' heart. That's what they instilled in us. It was something that was so important to them. Another way that my parents instilled this, when Damon and I were first dating, um, I asked him if he wanted to go to a family fun night that we were going to the county fair and he's like sure so he came with me and I said well we got to go to my dad's business first so we went there and every annually we would gather as a family at the business and my dad said we need to pray that this year we would honor God and that God would bless our business so that we can give to uh, missions and give to the kingdom so the kingdom can be advanced it was never about so that he could get rich it was always about so the kingdom could be advanced and so he prayed that over the business and then he stopped and he and him and my mom served us communion and then we prayed together and i know it made an impact on damon like wow you guys are just doing this in your business it's not just a church thing and then later in later in life my parents then gave each one of us five kids a communion set and they said we want you to continue this in the generations to follow with your kids and your grandkids this is not just a church thing that we take communion this is a faith thing that we do as a family and we have had the privilege and the opportunity to have our kids and our grands at our house and to pray over them and to pray for our, and watch our grands watch us take communion and them take communion and be a part of it. I'll be honest, I like doing it outside. I don't like the grape juice on my white couch. You know, I'm going to be honest. But they watch it and they're watching us go, wow, we live our faith out loud. We're living beyond ourselves. And that's what we want to model to our kids and model to the next generation. It's something that we did just about a year and a half ago 
when Damon was in the middle, middle of getting ready to start chemo, and my mom had a 90th birthday, and a lot of my family gathered here in Phoenix to celebrate her. And we came back to our backyard, and my brother, who's now the patriarch of the family, he led the communion time with all those cousins, all those people you saw in that picture, gathered in our backyard. And yeah, we bar, we had fun, and we played, and we swam, and all that stuff. But the most important thing that we did that night was have communion, and then they all laid their hands on Damon as he began that journey. That's a living legacy. That is modeling to the next generation, whether it's the good times or it's the hard times. We're going to trust the Lord. And we're going to walk in his goodness. And we're going to model that. Because that is the promises that God has told us. He wants us to continue to sow seeds, even as we get older, when we don't get to reap the harvest. That's what both of our moms are doing. They may not reap the harvest of this building and all the things, but they're both giving to this project. Why? Because they believe in the next generation. They're going to sow seeds into something that they may never eat from. That's modeled. We get that opportunity to model that as well. It reminds me of the story in the Bible of Ruth and Boaz. And when Ruth came to the field to just get some scraps of grain on the ground to take back to her mother-in-law so that they could have food, Boaz saw her and he told his workers, leave handfuls on purpose. Leave her handfuls on purpose so that she's not just getting the scraps. Do you know that that's the heart of God? When he sees us coming to receive from him, he's going, I'm going to leave handfuls on purpose. I'm going to leave handfuls on purpose for her and for him because he's modeling generosity. It's the heart of God. And he wants us to then in turn model that to the next generation. Yet often, so many times, we give God our scraps when he's given us handfuls on purpose. My challenge to you today is don't give them your scraps. Come and bring handfuls on purpose to the Lord. Give of your time. Find a place to serve here and belong. Give of your finances and watch God blow your mind with how he's going to give back to you. You could never, ever outgive what God can do for you, ever. To have a generational legacy, you must live a life of generous impact. Can you start that today? I'll join you. Hey, once again, I want to say thank you for watching today's message. Uh, do us a favor. If you enjoyed this, share it with all of your friends and family. And if we are making a difference in your life, would you consider investing back in to Mountain View? You can go to our Give page, and there you can invest not only in our general fund, but also our legacy and expansion project. It's been an honor to be with you today, and may God bless you.